I just read the book Bee Season by Myla Goldberg, and I hated it so much. So much. It's supposed to be about a girl who's nine years old and does spelling bees, and it turns out that I had to be subjected to a lot of details about her parents and her brother's sex life that I did not feel was necessary to the plot and I feel mildly scarred. Actually more than mildly scarred. I'm just scarred. You did this for what? Why not? <laughs> Why? Why not? <laughs> Why though? I just recorded a take where I plan to read out all of the parts that made me uncomfortable just so you could also go through that pain with me and it was 26 minutes long <sighs> this is how i feel post reading that i think it's pretty obvious i'm going to not read them out i'm going to summarize them because you don't need to sit through 26 minutes of me reading about three characters sex lives so, how I'm going to do this video is I'm going to talk about the few things overall that made me hate this book. Then I'm going to put up a timestamp on the screen that you should skip to if you don't want to hear about all the sex scenes. Then I'm going to summarize those. And then when I get back, get to the timestamp, it will be me talking about all of the non-sex stuff. The reason I read this book is because I was doing research into Jewish characters and non-Holocaust fiction because it occurred to me that there aren't many. The writing style just does, does not. I, I don't like it. It doesn't work for me. One of the things I really disliked was all the absolutely ridiculous metaphors and similes which you're going to get to hear all the really bad ones because I will read those out. Some other things that confused me, um, it says Eliza, the main character, is nine. However, her older brother Aaron is six years older than her and he's 16, which would make her 10. And at one point she's in a spelling bee talking about how she's daydreaming about this the boy she's up against aging out of the spelling bee when he turns 15. So he's 14, and then it says she's two years younger than him. Also, it was published in 2000. There's nothing to imply it takes place before 2000, based on like the things people are doing, the ways they communicate, blah, 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 except for the fact that there's a typewriter mentioned at least three or four times that her mom uses and PCs came into popularity in the early 1980s so that's confusing. I'll show you my sticky notes first. So the orange ones are Jewish mentions like mentions of Jewish stuff. Yellow ones that are sticking out are the uncomfortable sex scenes and the ones that are not sticking out are just normal weird stuff. Here's the timestamp. Go to it or be scarred. The first weird mention is that Saul and Miriam, Eliza's parents, in the third week of them dating, Miriam's mom goes to the library and gets out a bunch of books on sex so that she can be good for him. Then here's one I'll read out. This is more about Miriam and Saul's sex life. Saul realizes that Miriam's sexual prowess hasn't improved markedly since their first time together when he perceived her as an untried pupil who would grow to mastery under his carnal tutelage. Oh, now Aaron is trying Buddhism. Aaron is Eliza's brother, as I think I mentioned. He's trying Buddhism and he's going to meditate. This one's not like nearly as sexual, but I thought I'd put it in this section because he's meditating and he's worried about his family seeing his pubic hair. And 
I mentioned this passage to my friend and she was like, well, he could just turn around. And I was like, I wish he had because it would save me the scarring and then you wouldn't have to hear about it. So that first time he tried meditating, he was not naked. He was just wearing a bathrobe and now he's naked and he just ends up masturbating. And it's described in a bit of detail that I... Then it says, after his failed attempt at naked meditation, a severely chapped Aaron decides he'd better be better off going to the park. Yeah, go to the park so I don't have to hear about it. Then there's like a weird scene where Miriam like makes Saul have sex with her. Then there's another weird scene where Saul wakes up because his wife is sucking him off. Then Saul keeps trying to deny Miriam's sex and she just masturbates in front of him. Sometimes he gives in, sometimes he doesn't. I had to read about it. And Saul has a dream where Miriam rips his dick off. This is my least favorite passage in the entire book. And it says, after the sticky failure of his initial meditation attempts, Aaron decides he will only allow himself to masturbate once a week and then only on a day when he has no meditation plans because he's become a hindu and meditation is part of being a hindu in this book and then there's a whole paragraph about how he just spontaneously comes in his pants in math class and there's another scene where saul and miriam have sex and He's like, you don't actually want sex, you're dry. And she's like, yeah, I, I do. And then they have really rough sex and she bleeds and he feels awful. I feel awful after reading that. And Miriam gets hurt and Saul follows her up while she goes to take a shower. And then he's picturing her in the shower and realizes he's got his hands on his dick um this is the last one aaron straight up tells eliza who's in like sixth grade that now that he's hindu he can't touch himself which thank god he stops doing because i didn't want to read about it anymore why he thought that was an appropriate thing to tell his sister i really don't Okay, now that I hate myself for reading all of those, welcome back to all the other weird-ass stuff that goes on in this book. Oh my god. Like I mentioned, lots of really weird similes and metaphors. The first one is, The wheat has yet to be called from the chaff and given nicer desks. And the next weird part is this teacher who picks out kids for the talented and gifted program and the way she does it is she gets the class list and she goes down it and she goes tag you're it and circles the kids which is weird then there's this bizarre paragraph about shares which i'll just read because it's it's really weird so eliza has won her class spelling bee and now she is going to the school spelling bee she gets to miss fifth period math under Dr. Morris's watchful eye, she files into the school cafeteria with the winners from the other classes and takes her place in a plastic bucket seat. The seats are shaped in such a way as to promote loss of circulation after more than 10 minutes. Two holes in each chair press circles into the flesh of each small backside, leaving marks long after the sitter has risen. Each chair has uneven legs, the row stretching across the stage like a hobbled centipede. Okay, next weird part. Dr. Morris is the principal. Eliza's dad, Saul, goes to talk to him about the fact that Eliza doesn't get picked for the Talented and Gifted program. And Dr. Morris gets weirdly mad about this and starts thinking about how he wishes that Saul could see this picture of his daughter, Rebecca, who has some sort of mental disability. And apparently the only people who generally get to see Rebecca Morris's picture are the students Dr. Morris catches using the word retard. He escorts these students to his office where they're shown the picture in order to repeat the word, this time to his daughter's face. 
I don't really know how that was relevant. I appreciate the message that retard is not an appropriate word to be used. It's incredibly insulting. And that's a good point to get across. I just don't see how it's relevant to the plot. Neither is the fact that he wants Mr. Newman to get the hell out of his office. That's a direct quote. Just, we get this one page in Dr. Morris's viewpoint and it doesn't really make any sense at all. It's irrelevant. It doesn't add enough to his character and he isn't large enough of a character that he needs that development. So, I don't know. That's confusing. The next weird part is that Eliza gets placed in the race car reading group in third grade and the other reading group is the Rockets and she can't get it out of her head that while she is speeding around in circles waiting to be told to stop, other kids are flying to the moon. I just don't think that that is a thought that a third grader would have. I don't know. Um... Oh, the other thing that is really weird is this book has an odd focus on boobs for a book about a fifth and sixth grader. So they introduce one character named Cinna by saying that she's the smartest girl in the school. And then Cinna has blue contact lenses and big boobs. Everyone knows her eyes are fake because they were brown the year before, but Cinna insists that a lot of people's eyes change when they go through puberty. I don't feel like either of those descriptors were necessary to her character. Then there's like a page and a half where it just describes how much paper and books are in Saul's office, and I don't really think that's relevant. Then this line Saul discovers LSD and Jewish mysticism at the same time a chance concurrence that strengthens the validity of both this one doesn't mention sex but it's like not explicit so while Saul has ample access to drugs and female undergrads and his capacity as sexual and psychoactive guide to the student body the role has begun to wear thin Basically, Saul's backstory is that in college, he did a shit ton of LSD and had sex all the time until he met Miriam. And then they ended up getting married. Also, he got expelled from rabbinical school because he did LSD with his roommate and his roommate painted himself white and blue and ran into the dean's office. Oh, <laughs> this is a really weird metaphor. So Saul ends up being a cantor, which if anyone's not familiar with Judaism, in a service you have the rabbi who's the religious leader and then the cantor who leads the singing of prayers. Rabbi Meyer is the dentist. Saul, the congregation's lollipop reward for having kept their appointment. Lollipop reward. <laughs> Who gives out lollipops at the dentist anyways? Like, isn't there a whole goal not to give you candy so you don't ruin your teeth? Page 17 is the first place where Miriam is introduced to the plot, which is weird because Miriam is Eliza's mom, the main character. And by page 17, there is so much background done on her dad and her that it's just bizarre not to introduce her mom until that late you I didn't realize it until I got to that point but I just automatically assumed that Miriam was out of the picture especially because her brother was mentioned and then her dad is the one who goes into school to talk about how her brother Aaron got into the talented and gifted program and she didn't and it feel that feels like a conversation where if both parents were in the picture both parents would have gone I don't know it's weird so she doesn't get introduced to page 17 and then there's some weird descriptions of her like a hummingbird in human form Eliza equates the inside of her mother's head with the grand finale on a July 4th fireworks display she also only gets three hours of sleep every single night, which is 
relevant to the things I've already discussed with the sex life. That's a passage I accidentally skipped where Miriam is describing Saul's naked body. And I meant to discuss it in the other one. And I didn't- okay, so then there's this weird, weird passage where Aaron is looking at himself in the mirror because he wants to play shirts against skin and without chickening out if he's picked for the wrong team. And so he is standing staring at himself shirtless and asks to shirt or not to shirt. That's literally a line in the book. And the whole thing has like weird incestual vibes because Eliza's coming into his room and like the fact that he's so caught up in should he let her see his bare chest. I don't know, there's just some like weird stuff going on there. And then she stares at his chest and his chest hair for a long time and his nipples. And then she starts thinking about body hair in general. It's just really weird and incestual almost. And I don't like it. Eliza starts kindergarten assured that her six years older brother has vanquished all school born monsters, squids, or pumas. I'm confused about this passage because does this imply that squids and pumas exist at school? Because I don't know what type of school they were going to, but that was not my experience. <laughs> So Eliza tells Aaron that she has to go to the District B, and he says, don't you have to win your school B or something to be in that? Aaron's voice is a little louder now that his nipples are hidden. Just mere more weird incestually vibes. Then they go into this passage where Eliza is in kindergarten. The whole book is told in present tense which makes some of them really weird and it, because there's flashbacks and there's things about Miriam's past and Saul's past and it's all in present tense and it makes it kind of difficult to figure out when things are going on and it's just weird. I don't like it. But here's one passage where Eliza's in kindergarten and she sees Aaron being beat up and she, he's being beat up by these kids named Marvin and Billy. She has never witnessed Marvin's malice firsthand. His cruelty, like sex, is something she has only heard about. Something that only happens in places she doesn't go. And I'm like, why would a kindergartner have heard about sex? That's weird. Then she's comparing Aaron to a dog because he's getting beat up. And there's this really weird passage where she's like thinking of Aaron as a stray dog named Sucker who gets beat up at the school playground, which is extremely disturbing because why are a bunch of elementary schoolers beating up a stray dog? Why is no one stopping them? Why, why is that their first instinct? Most kids, I don't think, would go beat up a stray dog when if they saw it. I think they'd try and pet it. I don't know. But it's this really weird, really long passage where she watches them beat Aaron up and does nothing. The next thing I marked was that Billy and Marvin call themselves BM. Just, I don't know why. Um, but on the, on the first time they're met that's mentioned, they call them BM, and then they call them B and M, and I'm like, this author just doesn't remember what she's talking about. Then there's stuff about Eliza following Aaron around and realizing he gets bullied all the time, and it's weird. Okay, so now we're actually doing some spelling bee stuff, which is great because this book is supposed to be about spelling bees and has such little focus on spelling bees. It's just, it's so bad. I think I must be like missing something. I don't understand. It has 3.5 stars on Goodreads and I just don't get it. This is the worst book I've ever read. But anyways, here's something about spelling bees, finally. The curtain is opening on the District B. One startled fifth grader cries out, Ma stopping himself before the incriminating final M, his gaff mercifully concealed by the clapping. 
The same woman who moments ago had been exhorting Eliza and the others to urinate approaches the microphone. Her voice sounds like a soft focus greeting card cover. And then we get a whole weird passage from her point of view where it turns out that she's scarred because in her spelling bee, she got out on purpose so she could go pee. More like weird comparisons. By the time it comes down to Eliza and number 24, a small boy in a blue shirt the color of deodorized toilet water. Who picks that description for the color blue there are so many pretty things that are the color blue and you pick deodorized toilet water what the hell now we're talking about aaron's bar mitzvah and he says he thinks the day is a tootsie pop he must try to lick without giving in to the urge to bite through its chocolate center I thought it was really unnecessary that Saul picks Eliza up after she wins the spelling bee competition and then he realizes she's heavy and decides to start exercising and then that's never mentioned again and then she's like I have to go to the area finals but earlier she called them the state finals and then they're only called the area finals from then on so once again some inconsistencies also, the reason I was confused about Saul picking Alice up is because the general characterization in this book is so inconsistent. I think the author tried to rely on flashbacks to characterize the characters and give you them their motivations, but the issue is that their actions seem inconsistent. They say things throughout the book and if you had taken like everything Saul says and just given me a piece of paper with all of them and said how many characters do you think said these different things I would not say one like the way they speak is inconsistent their actions are inconsistent there obviously wasn't a lot of thought put into characterization in my opinion and that was one of the things that stood out as very uncharacteristic. On page 44 is the first time that the narrator refers to Eliza as Ellie and then it doesn't happen again until page 130 and then it happens a few more times towards the end of the book but it's weird because if you're going to introduce the idea of calling her Ellie in the narrator's perspective it needs to be introduced earlier than page 44. And, the character, the other characters, I think mostly Saul, do call her Ellie before them, but the narrator doesn't. Then there's this weird passage where Eliza is looking for a magical pebble that would make her popular, and she dreams about it all the time. Miriam laughs like a happy chicken. Fun fact, Eliza kind of just like gets obsessed with spelling bees and winning which I guess if you're a little kid and you really aren't good at anything and then you want a spelling bee you'll get obsessed. Before the bee Eliza had been a consonant slow and unsurprising with her bee success she has entered vowelhood. Eliza begins to look at life in alphabetical terms. School is consonantal in its unchanging schedule. God Full of possibility is a vowel. Death. The ultimate consonant. <laughs> okay, so this one is weird. Eliza knows this guy is uncircumcised because Aaron looked in the bathroom and I don't have any experience with bathrooms that are mostly used by people with male anatomy, but I'm pretty sure you're like not supposed to look. That's my impression. So I don't know why Aaron was looking and I don't know why Aaron was telling Eliza about it. Cause that seems invasive. But now we're back to spelling these stuff and a morbid camaraderie has arisen between the spellers. Numerous placards drooping from their necks like turkey waddles telling you the similes are out of control. 
now we have another weird mention of boobs. Though they haven't spoken, Eliza has developed an affection for the speller next to her, an intense and careful girl whose numerous placard lies in an upward tilt because of her boobs. Also, the fact that they call them boobs every time is just kind of weird, you know? Now Eliza wins the spelling bee, and the pronouncer's voice cracks the silence. A thickened shell protecting sweet meat. It's just the metaphor. Why? So now Eliza's looking at a picture of herself after she won the spelling bee. And Eliza's face is a still life of sus suspended disbelief. Her trophy, a baby she didn't know she was about to have. Then, on page 71, we find out that Miriam is a kleptomaniac. And later on, we find out that Miriam doesn't actually go to work. She uses her parents' trust fund to pay all the family's bills, and she just goes out and shoplifts all day, every day. Yeah. Now we're back to Miriam's kleptomania. When Miriam has pocketed an item, she experiences the ideal pregnancy. That's what it says after they talk about Miriam's special shoplifting outfit that she makes to go shoplifting. Now we're into Aaron's um, religious crisis where he's like, I'm not Jewish. So he goes to a Catholic church and he really just thinks they're going to be able to tell that he's Jewish. So he considers bleaching his hair to disguise himself, but decides that a bleached blonde Jew will look even more conspicuous than a regular Jew. And then he imagines that there's gonna, this siren's gonna go off and it's just gonna be like, Jew, 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 Jew. And then the congregation is gonna stare at him and the priest shambles towards him in that slow but inevitable night of the living dead way. I don't know. I have been to church. I've been to Catholic church. And at <laughs> last I checked that did not happen. And they did not recognize me for being a Jew. Now we're back to Eliza and she's having a nightmare where she's at the spelling bee, but the spelling bee is taking place at the bima where the um, cantor and rabbi stand in a synagogue. Her number is torn up from her neck and she's tossed off the bima into a teeming sea of heads and hands where her mouth is held open. Her old teeth are ripped out and a smaller, sharper set is shoved in. I just didn't really understand why. Oh, this next part is so weird. So Saul is estranged from his family because his father rejected Judaism, but was Jewish. And then Saul's mother tells him and Saul becomes Jewish again and his father doesn't like that. So he and his father are estranged, but then his father dies. And naturally, Saul takes Aaron to the funeral because what else do you do? And he takes Aaron to go look at the dead body and Aaron starts crying and peeing in the funeral. More stuff about body hair, which there was just too much of in the book. This one is about how Miriam has nipple hair that she thinks grew in when she was pregnant. It's irrelevant to the plot and confusing to me. So then Miriam starts breaking and entering. We love that for her. We're back to Aaron, and Aaron is in a park reading a book called Are You a Hindu? And this guy walks up to him and asks, are you? And Aaron thinks, Aaron doesn't realize he's talking about the book. Aaron wonders if this is the kind of man he's heard about on the news, the kind who goes to parks to find others like him to be homos with. And that is confusing to me because how could the author have a passage earlier which obviously condemns using the word retard, which is an insult, and then 
be comfortable using the word homo because that is also an insult and it just this whole passage is weird and uncomfortable and why why didn't Aaron realize that he was talking about the book he was reading is Aaron suppressing his gayness I don't know maybe <laughs> But it's weird, it's made me uncomfortable to read that. More weird metaphors. Eliza is at the first round in the National Spelling Bee. And the tension of the room has become a persistent odor. His nose has ceased to smell. That's from Saul's perspective. Um, so Miriam stole a dish from some people's house. She just walked in and took it and is reminded of the time she tried marijuana, which I notated with vibin. I really don't know why. I probably read this at like 1.30 a.m. Oh, so then Eliza's at round two of the spelling bee and she, there's this girl, Rachel, who is number 36 and it says, on this page that she's number 36. And then on this page, it says that she is number 35. And I'm like, they're literally on the pages across from each other. How do you mess that up so bad? Oh my God. Eliza loses the spelling bee. Then they're having pudding. Eliza looks at the unmarred surface of the pudding with longing, thinking she would easily trade eating her dessert for the opportunity to be it for a few seconds, serene and self-contained. So Eliza wants to be pudding. Then there's this huge long thing that goes for two, like three pages where Aaron burns his middle school gym uniform in the backyard just burns it, lights it on fire, and goes off. Another um, kind of incestual seeming simile to me is it says that Saul is waiting at his desk for Eliza like a wallflower hoping to get asked to dance which is just kind of weird to me. I mean, it's not fully incestual vibes, but I don't know, it's kind of weird. His random passage, which Eliza's doing some weird mysticism thing because it turns out that the reason Saul is invested in Eliza's spelling is because he wants to teach her to talk to God. Like straight up talk to God like Moses and Abraham are supposed to have and she's doing it and then she fails next time she promises remembering that for every baby there are countless neverborns then aaron decides that he's supposed to marry the guru's daughter <laughs> for no real reason he just decides he's supposed to marry her miriam decides she has to stop being a burglar so she goes back to shoplifting and she steals a shoe and then thinks like decides she has to get rid of it so she just chucks it out the car window then saul and aaron are talking to each other aaron pretends he's going on a camping trip when he's actually going to the hindu temple and this is describing aaron and saul it says the two resemble nothing so much as a couple concluding an awkward first date this is a father and son, and I thought that was mildly incestuous vibes. So Miriam ends up going back to breaking and entering and trying to rob people's houses because she wasn't getting the satisfaction from shoplifting anymore. And she gets attacked by a dog. The dog was in the garage, and it says the children of the house she fled will use the incident to convince their parents to keep the dog, which had been on the verge of being given away for its propensity to shit at the slightest hint of thunder. So then Miriam gets arrested at a 
different house, not the one with a dog. And then it turns out that she's been taking all this stuff that she steals and she keeps it in a storage container and turns it into art and calls it, she's like trying to make it perfect in Mundo. She justifies this all using Takun Olam, which is the idea of like fixing the world and like bringing peace. And she uses this to justify her shoplifting. Then um, Saul finds this rubber ball that Miriam keeps under her bed, which is the first thing she ever stole. And he's like smelling it. And then there's this really weird passage. I feel like I describe everything in this book is really weird and that's because it is. But there's this weird passage where he like drops the ball and it doesn't bounce and then he gets pissed off and tries to do it again. Then he brings it to her and she gets mad and rejects it because he touched it. She gets put in a psychiatric help facility. I don't know how to describe it. Saul straight up calls it the loony bin. And he goes to visit her and everything's going to be fine he says for the second time that morning feeling like a poorly trained parrot then there's this random passage i don't know who laura is i don't know who luke is but apparently the doctor last week the doctor informed laura that the clear liquid dripping out of luke's unconscious nose wasn't snot but science spinal fluid she really likes luke no offense, but why do I care about Luke's spinal fluid coming out of his nose? I don't know who he is. I don't know who Laura is. Oh, then I was confused because Cinna, the one earlier with the contact lenses and big boobs, um, she's in middle school now, but I thought that she and Eliza were in the same grade and Eliza isn't. So that was just confusing. I couldn't find any evidence that she actually was in Eliza's grade, but it was strongly implied especially with the fact that Eliza would sit with her at lunch and recess so then we get to the passage where Saul calls it the loony bin where his wife is <laughs> Aaron tells Saul that he's Hindu now and Aaron or Saul is an asshole about it he is so mean and so rude and it's insane oh now we're back to Eliza and I don't really remember what she's talking about, but it's like the time she went to the bathroom and two tall girls followed her in to stare over the kid's sized stall door as she tried to pee. She had to pee really badly. Her bladder hurt because it was too full, but the staring girls made it impossible. So then Saul is pissed off at Aaron again and Aaron has these prayer beads and they, they smell like incense and Saul says he's been sniffing the hand you use for your prayer beads like it had been touching a woman. Not that you know what that would smell like. The author describes Eliza's sweat like, like so. Were she to taste it, she would find it thick and a little sweet. Her body turned honeycomb. This is why Eliza is talking to God. Because Eliza straight up talks to God. She does. And while she talks to God, her tongue is that of a dead cow, lying huge and slack upon the kitchen counter. Then it describes Saul as a man in love with his daughter, which is definitely incestual vibes. And that is when he goes to watch her at her school spelling bee and she spells origami with a Y at the end. That's how the book ends. It is implied that that's what God told her to do. This book is so bad. It's just so bad. And I hope that this, of me just going through all the weird moments, helps you understand why. It was just poorly written. There was a lot of stuff that was extremely confusing. And it was just horrible. It was so bad.